me to go into a little classroom with busted up crayons because somebody taught me about Jesus and my mother and my father are the ones that taught us how to worship and live for Jesus. It wasn't the church. Why the preaching was pitiful and the building was ugly. It, was, it, it wasn't anything any of you would even consider. But it got us to the faith and it taught us who the Lord is and if we'd stop this absolute obsession with the perfect place and the perfect teachers and the perfect class and the perfect curriculum and the perfect carpet and the perfect toys and just realize there's only one thing we need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on every man, woman, boy and girl that will answer the questions and solve the problems. If Jesus could come any moment, you see, then I better make sure this is the best moment I've ever lived. If he could come before this service is over, i got to make sure this is the best one. It means that I've got to make absolutely sure that every one of you understands that nothing is more important in this universe than for you to be able to say, I'm saved and I know it. Nobody can make me doubt it. No circumstances can wear me out or wear me down. I will not reconsider. I will not question the Lord. He knows who I am. He knows where I am. He knows this thing that's eating at me, this problem that gnaws at me. He knows I wish he'd answer this prayer and get me out of this. And I would like to tell you that if it were time for the prayer to be answered, God would answer it. When the right time comes, God's going to do the miracle. But you can't afford in the meantime to let it tear you up and drain you and make you sick and make you wonder if you ought to serve God anymore or stay at home or just stay headachy all the time. Oh no! In the midst of the worst situation of your life there is an opportunity to stand up and give God praise because He has ordered your steps up to this point. God knows where you are. God God knows all about it. He doesn't know all about it. You, you got to quit saying, well, maybe we've done something wrong. What have you done wrong? God is just doing something. He's busy. He's at work. He does everything after the counsel of his own will. He doesn't give you an explanation. He just expects you to worship him and serve him with gladness. And the Lord will take care of everything else. You say, but I have this need. It's killing me. It's wearing me out. No, you only have one need. And that need make, means that every other need is met in your life. Paul said, now listen to this. Oh, my need are met in Jesus Christ. My God shall supply all my need. It doesn't say needs. It's not plural. He's not concerned about all this stuff that's flitting and flittering around you. You only have one need. His name is Jesus. And when you go for Jesus and serve Jesus and love Jesus, why, everything else will be added unto you. The devil's going to use all this pressure on you to keep you distracted, to keep you upset, keep you on edge. Keep, I know what I'm talking about. I wake up some days and I'm just on edge. I, I'm tense and I say, I better run to the prayer room. I don't walk. No, it's not. I better run to the prayer room and get before the Lord and let him rebaptize me in his blessed assurance. God is in control. Is he? Yes, he is. I need to know. Is he in control? Then he'll take care of it. And that's for all the believers in here who are going through tough times. Now I want to talk to people in here who are not sure. This is what Jesus taught. He spoke a parable. A parable to some who trusted in themselves. Now don't look there. Look here. Look right here. Do you ever wonder why I constantly say there are people sitting on church pews who aren't ready to meet Jesus? 
There are people sitting here this morning, very possibly, or sitting out in the FLC, or listening by tape or radio, who've never had a personal encounter with Jesus. Now, they've joined the church. There are members somewhere, but they've never had the new birth experience. And when you don't have a new birth experience, you're as lost as you can be. So he spoke a parable, a lesson, to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Look right here again. You know what this fellow that's about to pray was doing? Instead of using God's standard for his life, he was using his own man-made standard. He was looking around saying, hmm, I'm doing better than they are. Huh, I've never said those words. I, oop, I would never do some of the things that I see people doing. Hmm, I'm feeling better about myself. I, well, let's just see what he said. Two men went up to the temple to pray. That's funny, isn't it? They were both going to pray. Both going to church to pray. One, a Pharisee. The other, a tax collector. Now, got to remember, a Pharisee was the epitome of religion. Holiness in that day. And the tax collector was on the other end of it. He was the scum and off-scouring of the earth. He was as low as you can get. He was the stench in the nostrils. A tax collector. IRS. No, I didn't say that. You thought it. I was trying to bring it in perspective, give you some understanding. Low as you can get. Tax collector. And they both went to church and both went to pray. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Isn't that strange wording? He stood and prayed with himself. God didn't hear a word he said. Now, when you pray to yourself, what do you do? That's an interesting question. God, I thank you that I am not like other men. I'm glad that we have a decent and respectable family, a decent and respectable church and lifestyle, and we're kind of up in the middle of, of, of society and good, clean, moral, law-abiding, tax-paying, tithe-giving citizens and Christians. Lord, I'm just so glad that we're this way. We're respected in the community. We have a position in the church. I thank you that I'm not like other men because other men are extortioners. They cheat. They rob and steal. They're unjust. They don't know how to be fair. They're adulterers. They're always doing that which is unacceptable to God morally or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Now, listen. Jesus never minced words and everything he said had meaning. That's right. And he said even the most religious are going to hell. Can I say something? Yes, sir. Good people don't go to heaven. That's right. Saved people go to heaven. I want you to hear me up there. I want you to hear me out there. I want you to hear me on the radio. I want you to hear me by tape. I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me. Good people don't go to heaven. I don't care what talk radio says. I don't care what the analysts say. I don't care what anybody says. There's only one standard by which we live, and that standard says good people don't go to heaven. In fact, hell is full of good people. I hope, I hope that somebody is absolutely furious with me right now. And hopefully you'll go find it in the Scriptures, what you think you believe. Because I'm telling you that hell right now is full of good people. Not just Hitlers. Not just killers. Not just the, the vilest of the vile. But good people who went to church who belong to the Lions Club. Good people who worked for the associations of this and that who helped raise money. 
If Mother Teresa was not born again, she's burning in hell today. You cannot live and go to heaven until you have that one on one eyeball to eyeball, soul to soul, heart to heart encounter with a risen Jesus where you realize that he's God and that you need a good God to be your savior. It cannot happen. You've got to stop comparing your life to others. You've got to stop saying, well, I live in, in the upper echelon of my community and I'm a good person and people know me. You will die. You will burn in hell for eternity until you have that moment when the word of God and the spirit of God come together inside of you. And instead of defending yourself and reciting all of your good works and reminding yourself that you sometimes fast and give tithes of all that you possess and sometimes really make a sacrifice for the church until you get to the place that you say, I am nothing. I've never done anything worthy of God's grace. I'm lost. I'm pitiful. I'm damned for eternity. God be merciful to me, a sinner. And until that happens, you're as lost as the pusher, the prostitute. You're in the same category. Here's what Jesus said. Can you go to Acts chapter 10? I just can't let this go. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. He was an Italian soldier. Here's how the Bible describes him. A devout man, one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Are you ready for this? First of all, he was a devout man. It means that he was spiritually conscientious deeply religious committed down in his soul he didn't stand for tomfoolery he knew that there was a certain kind of life that ought to be lived a devout man then he feared God not just not just himself but he taught his whole family to fear God why they weren't disrespectful around the house they weren't a bunch of loose kids living any way they wanted to not even his servants could do that on his property he taught them to fear God to walk in reverence to tremble at the unknown and the holy then the Bible says he gave generously to the people. That means he was not a stingy man. He was constantly emptying his pockets. He saw someone in need. He gave them. He gave them food. He gave them money. He helped the down and out, and he was always doing it. And he prayed to God always. Think of that. I don't even think we can say that. He prayed to God always, whoever God was. Always. I, I'm just going to make sure you understand me right here. Here is a soldier with rank and military power who lived his whole life praying, God, whoever you are, help me. God, take care of my family. God, help me to be nicer to people. Oh, God, let me be what I'm supposed to be, whoever you are. And yet the problem with this man was that he was not saved. The reason I put the other verse up here in Acts eleven fourteen was to show you that when he was explaining to Peter why he wanted Peter to come and preach the gospel to him, he said he got these words. Peter will tell you by words by which you and all your household will be saved. He wasn't saved. I just feel like standing here and looking at you. Do you understand this? A devout man who feared God, taught his family to do it, gave lots of money to help the poor, and prayed all the time, but he wasn't saved. How can that be? Well, you tell me churches are full of people just like that right now. Do you hear me? That's why I keep saying it has to be that personal, life-changing encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, yourself, in your own personal heap of humility, Yes. You have to be broken. You have to be desperate. You have to be absolutely, sincerely believing that
that if you don't get help soon, your life is going to end. And until that happens, you're lost. Yes. Absolutely lost. And I, I must honestly tell you that unless you find that place and are able to point to that time where you say to him, I'm lost, I'm a sinner, forgive me. Right. You will never see heaven. Right. And the churches are trying to do everything they possibly can to get people to come. Have you noticed that? I'm going to tell you how to get somebody to come to your church. If you will get on your knees, sir, ma'am, and you won't get up until God turns you into a fireball, and then you will allow the Lord to use you to preach the gospel. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And you won't have to beg people to come in and sit through some kind of funeral dirge and some kind of bad musical program hoping they'll stay while they'll beat on the doors and line up outside in rain to get in where they can get a fresh drink of water. Hallelujah! And some more from... Am I telling the truth, anybody? They're not going to show up to hear the same dead, dried-up thing you've always done. The Word of, Lord, of the Lord is life. It is fire. It is food. It will set you free. It will set you on fire, don't you see? And that's what God's people are looking for. back to Luke if you would please and the tax collector standing afar off isn't that strange how religious people don't mind being right down in the limelight in front of everybody but this scum of the earth and he knows it standing afar off that means he's over in the corner in the shadows would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven he had no, no lists of good works. He wasn't comparing himself to anyone else. He knew what he was. Wouldn't even look up, but he beat his breast. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Justified means it's, you don't have one single sin left on your record. Justified means that even though you were a drinking gambler for 70 years, a womanizer, a thief, a liar, a robber, or just a good church-going person, that the Lord, by His blood, by His mercy, through Calvary, took it all away. And it's justified never sinned in all of my life. Folks, you cannot beat that deal. The Lord takes it all away. He doesn't leave one or two. He doesn't leave a smirch or a smudge. He takes it all away. And it's justified never sinned. Do you hear what he said here? The man went home justified. A tax collector went home innocent as a newborn baby. The off-scouring and lowest person on the planet of the earth went home as a saint a child of God born again by the Spirit of the Lord. Why? Because he who humbles himself yes, yes, yes. will be exalted. Who will do it? Jesus. If you humble yourself, Jesus will exalt you. Will. But if you exalt yourself, see, I'm not going to quit till I just nail this nail on. But if you still think you're a good person, you can't be as bad as all that. And you've done good works. And you've been a fine citizen. And you've never hurt anybody. You are going to the same hell that billions are already in. Simply because you've looked at yourself through your own eyes rather than the eyes of God. This is the only way to look at yourself. You see? Does everybody understand that up on the stage? Does everybody understand that here? But today, here's the good news. This very day, those who were blind can see. Those who were dead can live. Those who were lame can walk. Those 
who were exalted can be humbled so that they can truly be exalted. Jesus can save you today of any sin, any time. Does everybody understand that? It doesn't matter what you've done. Don't let the devil tell you that this is for everybody but you because only you know what you've done. He's a liar. Jesus can save to the uttermost those that are lost and who call on him. Receive an audio cassette of the message you've just heard for a $5 contribution. In requesting cassettes, please give the date on which you heard the broadcast. Write to Forwarding Faith, Post Office Box 2430, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. Or you may order through our toll-free number, 1-800-251-4024. Again, that number is 1-800-251-4024. Forward in Faith is a listener-supported broadcast. Please send your contributions to Forward in Faith, Post Office Box 2430, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320.